Good morning. Welcome to all of you. Uh, it is widely recognized that our childhoods, our upbringings, play a profound role in who we are today. Uh, some people carry tremendous burdens on their hearts from not so great homes, while others have maybe a false sense of confidence or, or sinful pride because of the families from which they were born into. And of course, there's a whole spectrum and gamut of places you could be in between. But either way, the fact of the matter is, our ancestry and upbringing plays a significant role into our lives. In the summer of 1874, there was a remarkable gathering that took place uh, where 400 to 500 descendants of Jonathan Edwards gathered together in Massachusetts. And if you know that name, you would know that he is arguably one of the greatest theologians we have ever known on this side of the pond. He was a popular preacher and an author and helped many, and helped many souls come to Christ through his endeavors. Uh, he started at Yale at age 13 and later went on to lead the University of uh, Princeton. He loved natural history and to study natural things. He was a big proponent of medical achievements and medical advancements. And he helped push them and drive them forward. And at this family reunion, they, they admired his memorabilia of, of he and his family, such as Sarah Edwards, his wife, her, her wedding dress, and a silver bowl in which he ate his nightly porridge from. And this family gathering was full of professors, business execs, government officials, ministers, and according to one account, women of unusual beauty and force of personality. The mood of the reunion was expressed by an initiator of the gathering when he said, let God be praised for such a man. For this is what he has brought about. It was as proud a celebration of any ancestry that has ever been on this side of the pond. And 26 years after this reunion in 1900, there was a study done of Edward's descendants, of, of who they are, where uh, they ended up. And, and the results are quite staggering uh, and become a piece of notoriety uh, at the time, for the study concluded that from the single union of Jonathan and his wife Sarah came 13 college presidents, 65 professors, 100 lawyers, and a dean of an outstanding law school, 30 judges, 66 physicians, and a dean of a medical school, 80 holders of public office, among them three United States senators, mayors of three large cities, governors of three states, and, of course, a vice president of the United States itself, and a controller of the United States Treasury. Again, all from the union of one man and one woman. So one of the obvious conclusions is about this Edwards family is, is having an industrious, godly ancestry is to one's advantage. But one would be wrong to conclude that being of such blood would lead to a, a guaranteed civic virtue among this Edwards clan. For the highest ranking member of the line Become, became one of the most godless villains in American history. Uh, when Edward's daughter gave birth to a, a son by the name of Aaron Burr, was of this line. And she looked upon this, this child as a fine child. But he would very soon become the very opposite of his grandfather's character and virtue. He rejected the Christian faith. He murdered the great statesman of Alexander Hamilton, if you have watched the latest play. He betrayed his country, and he even plotted to make himself uh, emperor of Mexico, to crown himself. A, a poet once wrote about this Aaron Burr, eight lines of clergymen converged to meet 
in Aaron Burr, but Aaron was Beelzebub in mocking miniature. Yeah, nothing like his grandfather then. Those splendid genetic qualities and heritage in the line of Edwards seem to have been demonically reversed with Burr. So we see that while a godly heritage, heritage can be of great value, it does not guarantee or even point to significant spiritual health or spiritual vitality. Many of us had godly parents, and, and for some of us, that godly heritage goes back generation after generation. Some of us, no doubt, have ancestors who were involved in, in shaping much of local religious thought or even local religious tradition and are great defenders of the faith, and we owe them a, a great debt. Some of us may be related to someone who was on the forefront of, of Christian ministry in an international uh, realm. But we must remember that our heritage can be one of blessing, but it could also be to our disadvantage. It can be even a, a curse to a degree, because this is kind of what we, this is not kind of, this is what we find in our text today in, in John 8. This is where our portion of scripture uh, comes to bear in, in verses 37 to 47 of our chapter, which is a very important passage of scripture for us as we consider these things then. It deals with people who, although coming from an outstanding line, an outstanding heritage, have come to wrong conclusions about their heritage and how their heritage really became detrimental to their spiritual health. But Jesus, our Lord, uh, tries to set them straight, and in so doing, he also gives uh, us an outline by which we can check our own spiritual health. Notice from our text, again in John 8, verses 37 to 47, and we'll kind of walk through this slowly together, uh, so I'll just pick out verse by verse pretty much uh, at a time, and then we'll, we'll pause to reflect. But you'll see that uh, that in verses 37 to 38, Jesus is frank with this, these religious elite. You know, he's, he's no longer pulling any punches. He, he's giving it to them straight. And, and as they're considering their lineage, their, their, where they came from, again, their laws, their traditions, they think they're good. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. And they say, wait a second, we don't live in darkness. Don't you, haven't you recognized our traditions, our heritage? Don't you know what, who we're descendants from? Well, it goes on from there, and, and we see what Jesus says here in verse 37 to 38. He says, I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. So here our Lord is accusing his, his listeners for depending on two things for their spiritual health. He's saying they're, they're at root depending on two things for their spiritual vitality. The first was their physical ancestry as the offspring of Abraham. And the other is their, is their spiritual heritage as they assumed that because of their religious heritage, religious traditions, uh, what they had in their possession, they assumed then that they were of God. So their physical ancestry and their religious heritage, their religious traditions, they thought their spiritual vitality was up to par. And we see that by Jesus' statement there in those two verses, that he struck a chord, he, he hit a nerve with those he was speaking to. Because look how they respond in verse 39. It says, they answered him, Abraham is our father. You know Abraham. You know that guy. Watch it. We appeal to him. We appeal to Abraham, our great forefather of faith. Surely you know him. You've read about him. He is our father, and we are part of his bloodline. And so they believe to one degree or another that, that through Abraham, through their great, 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 great grandfather or whatever, was stored up enough religious merit for them all. 
by which they were covered by Abraham's blood, so to speak. And we know this in part because uh, not long after this account, uh, we read from, from other early Christian sources, the, the Christian Justin Martyr was in a dialogue with a, with a Jewish man by the name of Trypho. And Trypho ended uh, this conversation with, with Justin Martyr by saying that the eternal kingdom will be given to those who are the seed of Abraham according to the flesh, even if they are sinners and unbelievers and disobedient to God. That's what this, this early uh, Jew by the name of Trypho thought. No matter who it was, if you're of the flesh of Abraham, kind of like these guys are saying, you're covered, you're in. The covenant applies and, and is guaranteed for you. So it's no wonder that the Jews responded confidently to Jesus saying, Abraham's our father. We bear his blood. We're covered. We're good. Abraham was their security as they were his offspring. But for Jesus, sonship, us being uh, children of God, being a part of the religious family, has nothing to do with blood lineage and everything to do with, with faith. It has everything to do with obedience in our faith. So he replies to them in our next verses. You see here, <clears throat> he says, If you were Abraham's children you would be doing the works Abraham did. You'd be acting like Abraham. But now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God, this is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works, and he says it again, your father did. Jesus tells it to them straight here. You're nothing then like Abraham. If you think back to this great ancestor of yours, of, of faith, you'll remember that when Abraham uh, heard the truth back in Genesis 12, when he lived in this pagan, idolatrous world, he responded in obedience, in faith, leaving this home country, this land that he knew, and going off into the desolate wilderness to follow the word of God and his promises. A great man of faith. He took it in, he heard the truth, and responded in obedience, in faith. But these religious elite who, who are now confronting Jesus here, even as they were considering belief, as we saw a few verses back, do no such thing, as we'll see by the end of the chapter. If you just look down, you'll see right before chapter 9 that they pick up stones. As Jesus says, they desire to kill him. They don't respond the same way, then, that their father Abraham did. They want to kill the bearer of truth, not listen to him. So in the end, they're not these great spiritual descendants of Abraham. No, they're, they're nothing of the sort. Sure, they may be physical descendants, but spiritual, they are not. So the point is, even as we may be godly or may be descendants of, of godly parents, godly grandparents, a godly context, this is not ultimately what brings us to eternal life. Have we received Christ for ourselves? Or are we just hoping that the merits of our parents or our parents' parents or so on and so forth are enough for us? Are we just going along with whatever tradition or whatever is familiar to us? Now, that's a big deal. Are we just going along with what we've always known? Because it's comfortable. Abraham stepped out in faith, leaving the familiarity of his own country to follow the Lord to eventually greener pastures. However, these religious elite end up not being the descendants of, descendants of Abraham that they hope to be, 
for, the, for they think it's these external religious practices that get them to the kingdom. But they don't. Oh, how, how wrong of thinking that is. Jesus tells them, he, he warns them, really, this isn't of Abraham. No, you're actually doing the works of your own father, your own fleshly father. Or worse, you're doing the works of a different kind of father. All to say is, you might not be the people of lineage that you think you are. Again, these are the religious elite, these are the religious leaders of the day. And Jesus is saying, you might not be of the lineage, this spiritual ancestry that you hope you are a part of. The bloodline here bears no significance in this context. This is a matter of the heart. It's not circumcision of the flesh, it's the circumcision of the heart. But these religious elite respond at the end of verse 41 in a quite snarky way when they tell Jesus, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Now this is, this is quite the protest. What they're saying is, we're not concerned about our spiritual pedigree. Again, we have all the merit badges. We have all the memorized verses in the class attendance. We've got it all. And we're not born out of fornication like you. We've heard the stories, Jesus. We've heard about your, your mom and dad in questionable circumstances regarding your birth. We've heard those rumors. But we, we are children of God. Though a godly heritage, let's not throw it away either, though a godly heritage can be such a good thing and come with great benefits, it can be a dangerous place as we can be so wrong within it about our spiritual state. Maybe we've never had to think for ourselves. We just went along with whatever it is. Maybe it's hedged us and kept us from making really bad decisions and choices, which is a wonderful thing. But maybe it's never forced us to consider our own spiritual condition. Many of us, yeah, believed we received Christ as children, and I'm, I, I think many of us probably had. However, it does not necessarily follow that because our parents have, have retold so fondly of, of our young conversion so often that we can describe it and remember it ourselves in, in every detail that we're born again. And so then even as, as parents, we might be guilty of desiring such spiritual life for our children, so much so that we imagine our kids having virtues that they never actually had. Our spiritual inheritance has nothing to do with biology, but everything to do with faith. Oh, I long for all of our kids to be saved at a young age. I hope this is all true of them. I'm glad, so glad that all of our kids are being raised in, in Christian wholesome homes. I think that's a, a great thing to, to each of our advantage. But I want us to also be aware that one does not necessarily mean the other does not necessarily uh, mean that there's, there's a spiritual inheritance that goes along with it. Will our kids respond in, in faith? This is the big question. As an example, Ed, Edmund Goss, who is a famous Cambridge professor, uh, in his autobiography, Father and Son, tells how he finally rejected his godly heritage and the faith of his parents. Uh, in one uh, particularly sad chapter, he recalls how his, his loving father was so desirous that his 10-year-old uh, Edmund to be baptized that he convinced the elders to interview Edmund, who says he, quote, sat on a sofa in full lamplight and testified my faith in the atonement with a fluency that surprised myself, so much so that my interviewer was weeping like a child. And this is a man that rejected the faith in the end. It was a perfect performance. A 
perfect facade. But Edmund Goss did not know or have this true grace in his life. So I think, like these religious elite, like some of these other stories, we too need to examine ourselves. Some of us might even have well, well-meaning family, well-meaning friends who have spoken in soothing tones about our, our baptism, about our conversion, and have appropriated in our lives maybe even a false assurance that we have fallen into this same pit as our ancestral religious elite because they're just telling us what we want to hear. If it was possible for, for these guys, surely we would be naive to think it's not possible for us. If it's possible for them, it's possible for us. They possessed tradition, heritage, the temple, the scriptures, all the institutions. They lived in the city of God. Certainly, they knew the truth. But to what extent did these institutions, to what extent did these traditions impede them from truly hearing God's voice? To what extent do our religious traditions do the same? Because they're familiar. And this is why Jesus' Jesus' reply in verse 42 is so important for us. He says, if God were your father, talking to them again, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he who sent me. In other words, again, sonship, adoption, our, our spiritual inheritance, our spiritual family, our spiritual lineage is about faith. It's about obedience, not about blood. It has nothing to do with tradition. And Jesus puts this even more simply a few chapters later when he tells his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. So true offspring, we we show our love for Jesus, not by trying to kill the son, this, this truth teller, but by obeying him, following him, walking with him in faith. Our adoption as, as in the family of God, again, has nothing to do with this spiritual lineage. This obedience. Walking in faith. And yet these guys are, they don't seem to be walking in faith quite following him, not quite loving him. No, we'll see again at the end of this chapter, they're picking up stones for their desire to kill him. He says, I and the Father are one. I am the physical expression of of God made manifest before you. If you say you have love for God, then you must have love for me. One of the clearest ways in which we can demonstrate our faith is that we have love for Christ. And we cannot answer this this question for anyone else but ourselves. So a simple question to ask is, do we love Jesus more than all of these other things? And if the Spirit does not indicate to you that this is the case, well then, maybe your heritage, maybe our heritage isn't working. There are other things that we love more. (laughs) Ironically, maybe one of those things is political expression that we love more than faith. I tell you, political expression, our political hopes, they're not going to last. I mean, you can fill in the blanks, Kamala, Trump, they're guaranteed to do whatever, but in four years we're going to come back to the same place and just fill in a new name. They're They're not our hope. Our hope isn't in our, our political ideologies. There's, there's more to it than this. 
Our hope is for an eternal kingdom that is to come. But do we love Jesus more than other things? I hope so. And then in verse 43, Jesus gets to the crux of the matter, uh, the cause for their error. Uh, they, they don't love because they do not hear. Jesus says, why do you not understand what I said? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. So these religious elite, far from abiding in Jesus' word, which we remember from a few verses before, back in verse 31, far from abiding in his word, they're not even listening to it. You can't abide if you don't hear it. You can't abide if you don't listen. And so they, they remain lost in, into the bondage of their own sins, abiding in the lies of their earthly fathers and their spiritual heritage, their bloodline. And then he goes on, Jesus goes on, you'll see it there. You are of your father the devil. Again, talk about pulling no punches. You are of your father the devil. He's saying this to religious elite, keepers of tradition, bearers of scripture, inhabitants of the temple. All the institutions that are religious of the day, they hold office of. You are of your father, the devil. And your will, your desire, is to do your father's will, your father's desires. Again, who's their father? He just named it. The father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Now, the, the problem wasn't that they couldn't hear Jesus physically. No, they could, they could analyze Jesus' sentences. They could uh, diagram and, and dissect what he's saying, pick out the verbs or, or whatever if they had the time. But in their souls, they could not hear him. Their hearts were of stone. Their minds were set on suppressing the truth. And so the word of God never penetrated their hearts. Oh, that we, though, would have ears to hear. Oh, that we would have eyes to see. Oh, that, that Jesus' truth would penetrate our hearts and enter into our lives. Does the, the word of God speak to us in such a way that it has an effect on us? That it changes us, it molds us, it shapes us? Again, if it, if it does not, maybe like these religious elite, it may be an indication that we're not in a state of grace. And then we see here, it's more of the cause of their bondage. As Jesus points out, to whom they actually belong. You're of your father, the devil, he tells them. And the desires of your father, you, well, that's what you want to do. He's a murderous man from the beginning, and, and you're soon going to be picking up stones. You don't hold to the truth, for there is no, no truth in him. There's no truth in you. He's deceiving and cunning. He's, he's crouching at the door, looking to devour. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's the father of lies. This is who you're from. Offspring of, of the devil... Uh, those in his bloodline have no desire to do God's will, for it's directly opposed to him. Now, this is also not to say that these guys or, or all the people that are of uh, Satan's offspring, as Jesus is putting it here, consciously desire to serve him. No, I would say very few go that far. But... I think it is common for us to see those that desire to serve themselves. Those that desire to do their own will. Those that 
uh, in the words of judges, want to do what is right in their own eyes. They are lovers of darkness and not the light. And this is fundamental to what sin is. Lovers of self that want to be like God. That's been humanity's, that's been man's problem from the beginning. Want to be uh, like God. Make ourselves prominent like he. And in this, Jesus is saying, they are serving the devil. Their father of the flesh. And so sin is not as, as simple as making mistakes or bad choices. But it's also about serving the desires of our own hearts to do the will of the enemy of God and being in bondage to those things. But as we looked at last week, Christ has set us free from those things. He has set us free from such chains. And oh, that we would have the faith in the Father that tells the truth. Now, to put it simply again, as, as Jesus is doing here, each of us are from one father or another. Each of us are either in chains or not. Just as we have one biological father, we all proceed from one spiritual father. Regardless of our heritage, regardless of, of what has been suggested by other people, we are either children of Satan or children of God. That's the, the plain truth of it. And it's a sobering truth. It ought to be a sobering truth. Again, our, our religious badges and ancestry do nothing for us in the end. Again, in, in fact, with them, we might find ourselves in jeopardy as they become a sort of crutch for us, like they were here for these religious elite. They're great signs that point us to something else, but if we're only admiring the signs, we never get to the destination. Karl Barth actually describes the life of, of those deceived into thinking that their religious ancestry is safe in, in one of his Romans 8 reflections. He says about these people, he says, their life is that of a people who are headed on a long journey. And along the way they find a sign pointing them westward. The signpost is there to convey to them of the destination. But instead of going on towards that destination, they stop and create a life for themselves under its painted words. They build a, a great civilization there. They are celebrating the signpost and telling stories of how they arrived at that marker. Rituals involve songs to be sung and written. Books are published and new liturgies are followed. A few travel on in return, confirming that the sign does indeed lead to the place promised. But the second, the third generation, have built a life around the signpost and have forgotten the meaning of the journey. The true father then, the, the destination in which their, their ancestors pointed, is not theirs. Nor do they love Jesus even like these religious elite. Instead, they exchange the destination for a signpost. They exchange the destination for what's familiar. Exchange the destination for tradition. What's comfortable. So a question for us to consider, again, as we go from here is, are we any different? If so, what makes us different? Is our piety a life under a signpost? Or is it from a deep-seated well that is rooted in our faith in Christ? Are we simply reacting to our ancestry and tradition, a defense of all that is holy and good and spiritual? But do we know little of God in all of it? And who he is? Oh, again, that we would have ears to hear and eyes to see, 
the word of God and abide in his truth. And then, oh, that we would know our, our spiritual lineage and the joy of it in Christ. And how good it is, how great it is, how fulfilling it is, how abundant our adoption as sons and daughters is. The joy, again, of our salvation. The joy that it is to be a true child of God. Not because of bloodline, but because of our spiritual inheritance. The joy of our freedom in Christ through faith in all that he has accomplished for us. Spilling his blood on a cross for us so that we might be called heirs, children of God as we walk by obedience into all that he has for us. The riches of his grace forevermore as we too are children, made children of God through Christ's work on the cross for us. Freeing us from the bondage of our sins, the bondage of traditions, the bondage of, of familiarity. Allowing us to live free in his grace and mercy forever and evermore. What a gift. What an inheritance. What a privilege. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time together once again. God, I pray that through the work of your spirit in each of our lives that you would continue to soften our heart and hearts and, and penetrate uh, deep within so that we may know you and the, the fruit of your gospel greater and greater each day. You would mold us, shape us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. That we would know the, the, the beauty, the wonder, the greatness of your inheritance as adopted sons and daughters of your kingdom. God, I pray that each one here, that uh, we would be an inheritor of this kingdom that we would be spiritual sons and daughters of your family forever. And so, God, I pray that for those that might be on the outside looking in, I pray again that your spirit would work, convict, draw, move towards repentance to, to see the light of your goodness, your, your grace and mercy. And for those of us that know this already, God, I pray that you would grant us the joy of our salvation. The beauty, the majesty, the peace, of, of our conscious, of our mind, knowing and understanding just the full benefit of what it means to be a child of you. Again, what a gift. What a privilege. May we know it. May we feel it. May we share it with others. Pray this in your son's name.